For Krima Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is political analyst and development practitioner Tessa Dooms and multimedia journalist and writer Lindsay Abney Schutel here to unpack their co-authored book titled Colored, How Classification Became Culture. Hi, Tessa. You challenge the notion that colored people do not have a distinct heritage or culture and that they are neither black nor white enough. So can you tell us more, what does it mean to be referred to as colored? Um, so for us, we, we took on the idea of talking about colored identity because there are a lot of stereotypes and a lot of misconceptions um, that colored identity is, you know, nothing in particular. You know, colored people have often We've often been told you don't have a culture or we've been told you're not black enough or you're not white enough and you know those kinds of stereotypes and um what the book is about is saying that um, we're not just saying you know what is colored we're saying who are colored people because colored people are a variety of different communities that were brought together by um, a history of slavery oppression and apartheid and um, brought together often by force rather than by choice um, but we all know the ways in which um, slave communities were brought here during the colonial era. We all know about how colonizers dispossessed people like the San and the Khoi um, and other black communities um, in the country. And then, of course, we know the apartheid project that separated people into racial groups that were created. And what colored people are is a mix of those different um, experiences. Some people are colored um, because they come from um, a slave ancestry and Cecil John Rhodes at some point decided that it was easier to use formerly enslaved people on the gold mine fields. And that was the first mm -hmm. time we actually saw the word colored being used. So instead of indigenous people, enslaved people seemed easier. Um, and so the separation between being black and indigenous and colored is born. Um, but also colored communities come from um, histories that, that are very dirty and ugly, you know, um, histories of rape, um, the rape of black women in this country by um, colonial masters, also um, as a product of love um, and love relationships that have formed over time. So it's, a, it's a, a multiplicity of things. But what eventually we come up with is that from all of this painful history, colored communities have formed a sense of identity, have formed a sense of um, culture and togetherness and ways of living and being in the world. And the book is about saying that there is a cultural experience or a set of cultural experiences that bind colored people together despite the bad history that coloredness comes from. And can you tell us about the inspiration behind painting this book? Yeah, it, it, as much as coloredness comes from a, a background of pain, this book also comes um, off the back of pain. So in the year 2020, um, while we were in lockdown, um, a young man named Nathaniel Julies was murdered by the police um, in El Dorado Park. Um, so both Lindsay and I are from El Dorado Park. And so because we're in the media spaces, her as a journalist, me as a commentator, people were asking us to comment on this as you know people would because it became a really big mm -hmm. news story. But it also became a very personal story for us because it was about our community that was enraged. Um, you know, there were many protests. There was a lot of backlash to that incident because colored communities have historically felt like um, the government doesn't hear us and doesn't take seriously the issues that happen in colored communities. In fact, I think during that time, um, the president made comments about the fact that this was common in colored communities because of gangsterism. When Nathaniel Julius was a 16-year-old boy with Down syndrome that was murdered by the police, he wasn't some gang or drug dealer. And so it became very, very emotional for us. And, and we were asked things like, why, why do people still want to be called colored? Why are colored people angry? Um, all of that. And so in, in partnership with Jonathan Ball, the book was born to respond to the idea that colored people have a legitimate space in this country. You know, in a time that everybody's angry, in a time that everything is going wrong, colored people also experiencing the worst of this country. And that we have a legitimate voice, we have a legitimate space in this country. And that it's important that people in, in this country and abroad know who we are as colored communities and that we are more than the stereotypes. Um, we are people that have something to offer this country. And can you tell us how race and racism have always been about diminishing people's humanity? Yeah, that's one of the central themes um, of this book because the ways in which coloredness comes about is very much tied to, to racism. Um, and particularly the apartheid moment. And so um, I talk about in the book 
the classification moment. Um, so the book's title is How Classification Became Culture. Because the, the apartheid classification is the last moment in history where colorness as a classification, a racial classification, is, is used. But I tell the story of how my father was classified. Uh, my father was in the Northwest, was raised in a Tswana um, environment and a, a village. And my father went to be classified as a 16-year-old boy. And in that moment, he was classified based on how he presented the language he spoke and the name that he had, which was Lesole. But my father went home and found the realities of what racial classification did to our country which meant that his family were making choices about how to be classified in order to decide what kind of life we would have. And that's what racism did. Racism is about white supremacy seeking someone to justifiably oppress, seeking a reason to say that there's one group of people in the world that are better than another, and racism becomes a justification for that. But the rationalities of racism are shown up in colored identity because when when there's a mix of whiteness in black identity, white people were seeking to say, if you have a little bit of white, maybe you are a little better, you know? And, and all of those irrationalities show up, but the consequence is still the same. The consequence for, for us as black oppressed people of the world, and yes, colored people are black as well. In the same way that you can be Zulu and black, I am colored and black. My father was denied his blackness, denied his name because he had to go back to that classification office to be classified as colored he had to lose his, his Twana name and we have a, only an English name and for decades my father never told us his name because he was afraid of the consequences of that because so violent is racism that it can even take away people's names because it doesn't see us as fully human and so we talk in the book about the ways in which um, racism really has been violent and destructive to us and that what we need to do is, um, you know, as Steve Rico and the Black Consciousness Movement taught us, we must actually lean into the idea that we must say all oppressed people, people who are oppressed by white supremacy, must see ourselves as part of a black mission to, to call out racism and to make sure that racism doesn't take from us our culture and identity, our family and friends ever again. And lastly, Tessa, how can colored communities reclaim their identity and take their place in the making of South Africa's future? Yeah, for us important um, in this book is that the arc of the book is what we call a reclamation arc. Um, and so it starts with the story about my father going to that classification office and having his name taken away from him and ends with the story of my father going back to his village and reclaiming his right to have the identity that he wants. Um, and Lindsay will speak a lot more about this in terms of the way we use culture to illustrate that there's more to the story than just the classification. And we are focused on the classification. We're focused on whether we use the word colored or not. We're focused on what the classification means in terms of other black communities. But to focus on the classification and the word colored gives too much power to Furvut. It gives too much power to Van Riebeck, it gives too much power to Cecil John Rhodes and people who wanted to make us only a label and hides the work that we've done to respond to that pain with making of culture, with the making of, of community, with making of language and food and beauty. And we want to say that there's more to us than a label. We are a full community with full rights and full expression and more importantly, in this South African story, we are not lost. And what we have to do to be a part of the story is not just fight for the word colored. We must fight for our right to self-identify, fight for our right to be fully ourselves, fully South African and fully part of the story. And so reclamation means a future where colored people feel empowered to be whoever and whatever they want to be in this country's context without feeling a sense of marginalization. Thanks a lot, Tessa. Thank you. Now I'm joined by Lindsay Ebony Chitel, here to add more to the book. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, food alongside language were used by apartheid-era population registration bureaucrats to determine whether one was colored or black. So what were regarded as colored mills? I mean, it was so interesting when, um, when we were digging through the archives that we found was one family had to go in and kind of prove this, this, they were called the Goliath family, and they had to prove that their father was in fact colored. 
And so the wife makes a statement to the police. She says, no, listen, at home, we don't eat pap, we eat rice, we, um, we eat meat on Sundays, um, and, you know, he doesn't drink um, komboti, he drinks uh, beer or spirits. So that was, it was these very silly, not silly, but these sort of everyday commonplace things that were used to determine one's culture. I think Tissa always says this, is that, you know, it's a reminder that colored people have always had a culture because the apartheid government used elements of that culture to draw that line between black and colored so clearly because they use those elements of culture. And then language too. Someone else in another testimony said, we don't speak, we only speak Afrikaans at home. That's the language. And then they would come in speaking Afrikaans to show that this is, that they were in fact colored and not black. And that no, no, we don't speak any black languages. So even if people did speak black languages, they simply denied it. And Lindsay, can you tell us more on how colored people's limited prospects were challenged in the Cape in 1905? Yes, at the time there were certain um, colored individuals who had sort of risen to a sort of a limited elite and where they were allowed to train as artisans. Um, some were trained as teachers. I think some one or two might even have gone as far as becoming a doctor. And one of those is Dr. Abdul Abdrahman, and he then forms what is called the African People's Congress or organization. And it becomes one of the earliest political movements for colored people. It later becomes the Colored People Congress. And what it does is that it begins to challenge the way in which colored people are f don't have a lack of franchise in the Cape and also begins to challenge colored people's political formation at the time. And so his daughter, Sissi Gu, uh, becomes one of the, um, the main voices in colored freedom. And what they do is that those, those professionals join unions and they, they, they become more politicized and they become a voice for colored people. And what they also do is that they refuse to participate in Afrikaans. And so what they do is that he also starts a newspaper where he writes in English. Um, and he writes in English specifically because he's talking to a certain political elite. And it becomes the grassroots for colored people standing up and saying we want to be seen as separate. But then I think the difficulty and the challenge with that is that it was still very much different to what was then at the time seen as the Native Congress. And so I'm using, these are not the correct, 100% correct terms, but what, was, what happened at the time then is there was still a, a, a separate political identity. And then when those Congresses in exile join what later becomes the African National Congress, um, that's when that political expression comes closer to what is, years later, um, the National Unity Movement and then also separately the UDF. So that, 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 that political expression just becomes a way for colored people to A, create a central identity, but also to push back against the governance of the time, but also still maintains a separateness from blackness. And can you tell us how Nathaniel Julius Meda in El Dorado Park became the clarion call for colored nationalism and consequences? It was so interesting. I think, you know, during that time, and, and to just t touched on this with um, the resonance of the George Floyd uh, murder in, in 2020 in the United States and how colored people looked across the ocean, not for the first time, and saw what was happening in the United States and thought to themselves that what is happening there is happening here. And what they do then is instead of making it a cut, making, picking up the Black Lives Matter hashtag, which had gone around the world at this point, they used the Colored Lives Matter hashtag. And I think what that tells us is that even then there was a desire of separateness from the black experience. So it's interesting that they didn't see that, that their problems were the same as the people across the road in Pumville, because El Dorado Park is, is technically part of Soweto now. It's across the road from Pumville. Cliptown joins our neighborhoods. It always has. Um, and so they saw themselves as separate, but they were able to see themselves as, you know, with the American experience and that we've seen in music and culture. Mm -hmm. But coming back to the political experience, that, that separate hashtag was then picked up by certain political leaders where they zeroed in what was a form of ethnopolitics where instead of saying to people that what you are experiencing is not unlike what people across Union Road are experiencing, what they did was is they zeroed in and said, you as colored people have an isolated problem. You as colored people are the victims of a political system that first said that you weren't white enough and now that you aren't black enough. And, and it's a very dangerous thing because what it does is, is that it continues that separateness of colored people and it removes our experience from the shared experience of political oppression in South Africa and globally. And I think that's why, and you know, Tessa and I will repeat this continuously, is that we are politically black and ethnically colored. So culturally, we identify as colored, we have the colored markers, but politically, we see ourselves as black women. And that is how we move through the world most often.
And I think what's important is for us to begin to see that shared black experience because when you have a political experience that lives off that sense of isolation, it doesn't create a shared solution, which is what South Africa needs right about now. Also, what different languages and practices and colored communities mean to different people? There are very many different ways of being colored. Um, and it comes from, you know, you might be like with Tessa's family in the Northwest where you are the direct descendants of a German man and a Matswana woman. Or you might be like my family who um, were enslaved people who came along with the great trek to KwaZulu Natal and then lived in a small town and, you know, married into Zulu families, but also married into other colored families or colored families that had, had been seen as colored. And then you also have people uh, down at the Cape who are Malay, uh, people who are San and Koi, who, you know, some, some of them rightfully reject the term colored. And so there's a mix and there's a very different way of being colored. You've got people in Guadalupe Natal, for example. Um, there's, there are specific families like the Duns and the Kings who would have, or the Finns in particular, who would have come from a Scottish, Irish or English father and a Zulu woman. And so that, so those different expressions find themselves coming together under the Group Areas Act. And so what we find is that even though you've got these very different ethnic and sort of racial backgrounds, what you have is a very sh shared sense of cultural identity. And that cultural identity is brought again together by the fact that all these disparate groups were pushed into the same neighborhood. Given this moniker, you are now colored and this is who you are. And so what we find is that there are little, you know, in, those, in the, the heartbreak of the Group Areas Act, there are little moments of joy that people create. And one of my favorite things is the Cook Sister, for example. Um, people in Cape Town always tease us and say, up in Joba, we don't have Cook Sisters. We do, in fact, we have them all the way to Durban. So much so that my Indian friends thought that Cook Sisters were an Indian dish. <laughs> and I said, no, it's actually. And, 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 the cook, and the Cook Sisters, this moment of where it, it comes from a Dutch donut kind of thing. And it was then spiced by what I'm assuming would have been an enslaved Malay cook in a Dutch kitchen and she spices it with the spices of back home, cardamom and cinnamon and nutmeg. And that then kind of becomes the food of a people. And that food, we don't exactly know how, but that food travels around the country. And so those particular markers, and my favorite joke with Tessa is that she always thought for Easter that everybody ate pickled fish. So my family, we have a pickled fish competition. Um, you know, whoever gets to make the, you have to graduate to the pickled fish. And this is something that is found in colored homes and turns out it is in fact not celebrated in other homes. And we don't always know the stories of how these things came to be, but it's always in these little moments that people have held on together and certain foods that we eat and the language that we use. I mean, even though I have to say people from Guzul Natal hardly ever speak Afrikaans, um, but there is still a shared sense, a shared experience among colored South Africans that makes us who we are. But what we hope is, and this is why we were so deliberate in how we wrote the book and how we, we tried to bring in as many experiences from around the country as possible. So people to see that there are more, there's more than one way of being colored. There's this big, beautiful, but also deeply painful shared history, but there is joy and reclamation in what we've been able to create as a culture and as a people. And I think, and that's, that's something that we share and that's what makes us, makes us colored. Whereas before it was an apartheid code, now it's this, shared experience of coming together and making the best of what we were given. That was Tessa Dooms and Lindsay Ebony Chutel speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about Khaled.